I think what's happened in this chapter is the British Army has, is being brought kicking and screaming out of its colonial past. It's changed. You can't do it anymore and hope to cover it up. In the last few weeks, you've probably seen a lot of talk about soldiers being attacked by human rights lawyers. Now, Britain's Prime Minister Theresa May has vowed to protect UK troops from what she calls a legal witch hunt. We will never again, in any future conflict, let those activist, left-wing, human rights lawyers harangue and harass the bravest of the brave, the men and women of our armed forces. There has been a flurry of recent headlines about a witch hunt against soldiers. Some of the media claims put forward are that human rights law put the army in danger on the battlefield. And that lawyers are targeting soldiers. And that soldiers need to be better protected. But how did we get here? Some of this goes back to the Al Sweedy inquiry. This inquiry is happening because of what is contained within these bags. The bodies of Iraqi militiamen and a dreadful accusation that they were murdered by the British soldiers who had taken them prisoner. The inquiry found that British soldiers had been falsely accused of torture, murder and mutilation in an attempt to discredit the British Army. Entirely the product of deliberate lies, reckless speculation and ingrained hostility. Although some instances of British soldiers mistreating Iraqi detainees were found. This verdict sparked a big media storm. And from this, some even started to suggest that any claims against British soldiers should be thrown out. Public interest lawyers, a human rights law firm representing detainees, shut down and another prominent human rights law firm is being investigated. The Iraq Historic Allegations Team, I had to France, was set up by the government to investigate historic allegations against the British forces in Iraq. They received allegations of potential criminal behaviour relating to 3,367 victims. Now, IHAT is under huge pressure from some politicians and the media. Some have even claimed that there's no place for human rights on the battlefield. So we spoke to former Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas Mercer, now a chaplain. He was the Army's chief legal advisor for the Iraq War. We asked whether it's really true that there's no space on the battlefield for the European Convention on Human Rights. There's this notion that somehow commanders on the battlefield are fettered by the Convention on Human Rights. It's nonsense. It doesn't affect the battle at all. The battle is covered by the Geneva Conventions. It only affects how you treat personnel if they're captured or if they're wounded. The Geneva Convention governs legal parameters on the battlefield. The European Convention on Human Rights... Oh, didn't we leave the EU? No, it's not actually affected by Brexit. Oh. Mostly affects how people are treated when in detention. It doesn't actually affect what we do on a battlefield. So if, as Mercer says, these laws are not restricting soldiers' activities on the battlefield, why are the media and the government reacting like this? Yes, I think the media are dictating the discourse, but their strings are being pulled by the Ministry of Defence, who are dropping well-chosen cases into the public domain. Uh, if you look at the recent um, stuff in the paper, there was the case of Kareem Ali. It was very serious. It sort of got one day in the press and then it was dropped and then we're back onto the spurious line again. Well, why did no one stop and focus on Kareem Ali? Kareem Ali was a 15-year-old Iraqi civilian. In 2003, British soldiers forced him to jump into a canal and watched him drown. In the same year, another Iraqi civilian, Baha Musa, was tortured to death while detained by British forces. And there have been many, many others. In fact, the MOD has already paid out £20 million across 326 cases through IHAT. Many of the cases referred to IHAT were about detainees being abused. Some of them had to endure use of the five techniques. So the five techniques are um, hooding, stress positions, sleep deprivation, food deprivation, and white noise. Uh, and in about the first month of the war, I discovered interrogators carrying out these five techniques on the Iraqi prisoners. The whole idea of the five techniques is you don't leave a mark on the body, you just mess with people's minds. You put them under immense pressure, and the long-term psychological effects of that are only just beginning to be realized. As well as the five techniques, there are also a considerable number of allegations of physical, um, sexual and religious violations during interrogation. And that too is illegal. It breaches human rights law, it breaches the Geneva Conventions, but simply to blame it on so-called ambulance-chasing lawyers, I'm afraid, is just uh, typical 
of the way these cases are dealt with. At the beginning of the Iraq war, the Ministry of Defence tried to argue that these techniques were legal and that the European Convention on Human Rights didn't apply, before later admitting in court it did. Now, Defence Secretary Michael Fallon has announced some new measures. So we're working hard to get the vexatious claims thrown out. But much of the litigation that we face comes from the extension of the European Convention on Human Rights to the battlefield. That has been damaging our troops, undermining military operations, and costing the taxpayer millions that should be invested in defense itself. So I can announce today that in future conflicts, we intend to derogate from that European Convention. We don't know exactly what these proposals will mean because the details haven't been laid out. But if we do derogate, derogate. it means opt out of parts of the European Convention of Human Rights in future conflicts. This could potentially make our Ministry of Defence less accountable, both to civilians and to our own military personnel. Rather than talking about you know, improving you know, accountability, it sounds very much like it's about diminishing accountability and that's something of serious concern to Amnesty International. The European Convention of Human Rights and the Human Rights Act are there for us as individuals to hold the state accountable. It's not the other way around, but often that is lost in the narrative. The European Convention on Human Rights has been used by soldiers and the families of soldiers to actually address some of the shortcomings in the kit that they've had. Uh, and there was a, a case in the media some time ago about the use of snatch Land Rovers and how they weren't armoured against improvised explosive devices. That used the European Convention of Human Rights. OK, so the European Convention on Human Rights has actually been used by soldiers and their families to gain justice, which like wouldn't have been possible without those laws. Yes, and so Theresa May's suggestion of opting out of part of the European Convention on Human Rights still wouldn't stop claims of like inhuman or degrading treatment being brought against the British forces. So why are they doing this, Ruby? <laughs> One aspect it does change, however, is the potential, f uh, and this is seen to be a bit of a Trojan horse, is soldiers and their families who've lo lost loved ones, so they haven't been given the right equipment, uh, and something's gone wrong on the battlefield, and is that a way of blocking their rights to claim against the government? And that's seen as perhaps uh, just as much their intent uh, as trying to gain some political capital out of this. We need to keep it in mind that if we keep pushing this line about supposedly vexatious lawyers, it means that we risk forgetting about the hundreds, if not thousands, of legitimate claims of death or abuse brought about as a result of the actions of our government or military during armed conflict. The proposed changes are damaging to soldiers and civilians as it makes it harder for victims to get justice. I think what's happened in this chapter is the British Army has, is being brought kicking and screaming out of its colonial past. It's changed. You can't do it anymore and hope to cover it up. I mean, they're having a very good go at doing it. But I think there's a sea change in this. How can we be sure that the British government are held accountable for their actions? Tell us what you think in the comments below. And for some context on the relationship between Britain and Iraq, click here. نتيجة هاي الحرب يعني قانون أي قانون أي دولة ماكو هو أي شغلات تغيرت بالبلد نتيجة هاي الحرب دخلوا إرهابيين هاي تفجات جاسر يومية إحنا كشباب يعني نخاف نطلع